Well, this morning as you give, this is going to, I promise this video you're about to watch is going to tie into my message. It's not just a ridiculous, crazy video for the sake of showing you a ridiculous, crazy video. It does actually tie into what I'm going to talk about today. Some of you that you have been on Facebook, you saw that I shared this video, that you're going to get to enjoy it again. And it gets better with age. So this is why if you've already seen it, it's just going to get funnier. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I hope you appreciate the next minute and a half of your life. We're going to soar off the podium into the water, looking for underwater showmanship. Then we'll go to you for all of our scoring. Now, the way it's going to work, I'm going to ask you all we're looking, what we're looking for in this competition. And the only thing we're ever looking for in belly flop competition is pain. So when I ask you what we're looking for, you're all going to scream pain. Let's try it for practice. What are we looking for? That's right. And then we're going to count you guys into the pool on three. One more time, give these guys a huge round of applause, our six competitors. All right, here we are, starting off the competition. He comes with all the way from Michigan. Please welcome Scott to the podium, ladies and gentlemen. Scott is making his way up to the top of the podium. Wait first to catch you in there, Scotty. Now, Scott has not seen the sun since the early 80s. Don't, don't stare directly at him without protective eyewear. You're so white, you're almost transparent. He's been using SPF 1000. All right, ladies and gentlemen, what are we looking for? Count them in. Three, two, one. Here's Scotty. What? All right, wait for it to pop up. Give him a nice round of applause. Our first flopper into the water, Scott from Michigan. All right, Scott, take a look at the side screens here for your replay. Check out the uh, replay. We'll, we'll call you up to the podium there, Eager Beaver. What's happening? All right. Here comes Scott's replay fantastic. Look at the aerial assault like a flying squirrel. Look at this, no fear all the way through. Does not falter right into it. And let's check out the underwater camera right after this. Did not even falter. Hits the water belly twice and let's so. That is my five minutes of fame from the Royal Caribbean Men's International Belly Flop Competition in 2013. I did not win. I kind of beg to differ. Like, they made me go first because I was the smallest guy. They, they, they lined us up by uh, weight and they said, you go first. And I think I had the best technique and execution. But I didn't have the best splash, apparently. But the thing I want you to notice, it, it's for me, belly flops are something that, I, I don't know, when I was a kid I started doing them because I felt like maybe I could impress people by doing really good belly flops. And they, for some reason, I know as soon as you saw me hit the water that first time, I heard that kind of groan of like, oh, that hurt. Because how many of you have ever accidentally done a belly flop before? And yeah, it's, for me it doesn't really hurt. When I was in high school, we had our swim class, which I never really understood why they made everybody go in the pool and practice swimming in, in high school. But we had a free day, and I did one off a diving board once. And it was one of those moments where it was a, kind of impressive for everybody, and then I got up and like walked back to the locker room as quick as, as I could, because I had a white spot in the middle of my chest, and it was red radiating out. Like, I was in pain, but it was one of those moments of like, I just impressed everybody. I think everybody looked at me and was like, no, that's pretty stupid. But I went just like that one, just full-fledged, gave everything that I had. And today we're going to be looking at a story in the Bible, uh, found in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50, with an alabaster jar. And we're going to be looking at an individual, a woman that goes unnamed, who gave everything. And I would say that it probably hurt a lot more than a belly flop ever would, but gave everything willingly, knowing the, what the cost would be, but that the reward would be much greater. So we're going to go ahead and look at this passage in Luke 7, 36 through 50. One of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house. He took his place at the table. There was a woman in that town who had lived a sinful life. She learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with a special jar of perfume. She stood behind Jesus and cried at his feet. And she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair. She kissed them and poured perfume on them. The Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this. 
He said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him. He would know what kind of woman she is. She is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain lender. One owed him 500 silver coins, the other owed him 50 silver coins. Neither of them had money to pay him back, so he let them go without paying. Which one of them would love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who owed the most money. You are right, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman. He said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water to wash my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman has not stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You did not put any olive oil on my head, but she has poured this perfume on my feet. So I tell you this, how many sins have been forgiven? She has shown that she understands this by her great acts of love. But whoever has been forgiven only a little loves only a little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to talk about this among themselves. They said, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. We can look at this passage and a lot of times it gets confused with a couple other passages that happen. Uh, notably in Matthew 26, 6 through 13, Mark 14, 3 through 9, and John 12, 1 through 8. There's four passages, one in each gospel, that tells of this woman who pours perfume on Jesus' feet, washes his feet with tears, and dries with her hair, but they're not the same story. That if you really you take a look at them, if Matthew, Mark, and John, those three passages are in the last week of Jesus' life. And John refers directly to Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. But this passage, if you look at Luke 7, you, and you keep going through the book of Luke, you realize that there's a, a Luke 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, all the way. Past, I believe it's chapter 22 where Jesus is going to the cross. I may be off by a chapter, give or take. But there's quite a bit of time from Luke 7 to Luke 22. Where in the other three instances, it's noted as the week where Jesus is going to be put to death. And so these two passages, they're, they're similar, but they're different. And I want you to see that this morning, that there's two reasons. There's a reason why Mary anointed Jesus' feet and did what she did. But there's another reason why this woman did what she did. First, though, I want you to see a picture of what an alabaster jar would look like. And so this is... What it would look like, what she would break, very similar to marble. It was an easy uh, kind of stone to break, but at the same time, it was strong enough that it would contain and hold all the scent of the perfume in this bottle. The thing that I want you to imagine, though, is it's very similar to a piggy bank. How many of you, as a kid, you had a piggy bank and you filled it with coins? And that I know back in the day there wasn't like the rubber plug on the bottom. So that if you wanted to get into the piggy bank, what did you have to do? You had to break it. And so often you would treat that your piggy bank as something that you don't tap, you don't go into. Because the moment you break it, and this has always seemed silly to me, you break the piggy bank to get your money out. And then what do you have to do? You have to use money to buy a new piggy bank. Like, that concept never made sense to me as a kid until they started making the piggy banks with the little rubber stopper. But even then, if you put money into it, uh, not just coins, but money, it's like that whole shaking and, and working to get out. Then there, like, inevitably, it felt like there was always like a penny or a dime or something that got stuck in, one, in the piggy bank's feet that you really either had to break it open or you had to keep moving around or just give it up and just say, all right, that, that coin, that's staying in there. But the alabaster jar was the same thing. In order to get the perfume out of the bottle, the bottle had to be broken. And that once this bottle was broken, there was no going back. The, that all the essence of that perfume would have been out in the air. That monetary value of, a, of a, an alabaster jar like this, and we see it in the accounts of Matthew, Mark, and John, that Mary's was worth about 300 denarii which would roughly translate to $54,509 in our economy today. $54,000. That that's what Mary broke open and poured out at the feet of Jesus. So when we look at Luke, we don't get to see how big, 
and when you look at this jar, it, it depends on the value, the, uh, how much money your family had, how nice the perfume was, how big the jar was. But I want you to imagine for a moment, it, even if, let's say, the value of the, the jar in Luke uh, chapter 7 is only 100 denarii, you're still talking a sizable amount of money that this woman brings to the feet of Jesus and breaks open and then pours out. It wasn't something that would easily be able to replace, that typically you probably would only have one, and they were used for two different reasons in the Bible. The first reason, and this is what Matthew, Mark, and John, those accounts would show, is that it was used by Mary to anoint Jesus for the preparation of his dying. That it was foreshadowing that this is what's going to happen to Jesus, and I am preparing his body, I'm covering him with his perfume. The other case, though, that happens here in the, the uh, book of Luke is that this alabaster jar often uh, would be used as dowry in when a woman would marry a man in the Bible. And what she would do is on their wedding night, she would take this alabaster jar, she would break it, and pour all of the perfume at the feet of her husband, saying, all that I have, all that I am, is now yours. And that's the light of what's going on in this passage. Because it's earlier in Jesus' ministry, he's not being prepared for death yet. This is her coming to the feet of Jesus and saying, All I am is you, or all I am is yours. Take everything I have, it's all yours. The interesting with this, this passage as well is when we go back up, we, we learn that Simon had not welcomed Jesus into his house. During that time period, and it may seem weird to us because if somebody comes to our house today, we don't typically, uh, in the American culture, I mean, depending on some of your backgrounds of what your, uh, where your family may have come, came from, maybe that is still the case. Uh, my family background, a good chunk of it is German, so we definitely don't do this. But uh, we don't greet other people at the door with a kiss. Like, we just don't, like, my family, like, maybe there was, like, a hug and kiss for grandparents when they left, but there, there wasn't this, like, oh, welcome to my house, let me, let me kiss you. Some of you, maybe that you're Italian, that is your heritage, and that you know, like, you're going to walk in, and you're going to maybe have a line of the people that, like, you got to kiss this person, this person, this person, this person, you know, this person's left cheek, that person's right cheek, whatever it may be. Your backgrounds may be different, but in this culture, you are greeted with a kiss, and that because you were walking down dusty roads, your feet were washed, and you were taken care of. So Jesus gets to Simon's house, and that doesn't happen. He identifies the fact of, I have come into your house, and you didn't take care of me. You, you didn't wash my feet. You didn't greet me with a kiss. And Simon, you're going to point out this woman. You're going to point her out and say that stuff is wrong with her, that she doesn't have her act together, that right away Simon calls her a sinner. Now the interesting thing is you go through a lot of different translations, and I did it even again this morning. There's a few translations that become like the message where it's more of a um, I lost the word. It's not a direct word for word translation. It's more of kind of thematically trying to move into storytelling language. But when you look at the, the King James, you look at the NIV, the New American Standard Bible, you look through these different translations of the Bible, None of them say that she's involved in prostitution, although a lot of people in a lot of commentaries automatically assume that. And it's interesting that we would jump to a worst-case scenario. Maybe that is what her sin is, but the Bible doesn't say it. Simon, whatever it was, whatever he saw, whatever he knew that she was involved with and said, well, this woman's a sinner, he automatically threw all kinds of judgment, all kinds of of shade in her direction and saying, she's bad. Like, you're seriously, you're going to let her come in here and you're going to let her put on this kind of a scene. You're going to let her wash your feet with her tears and her hair and she's going to touch you and pour perfume on you. This is horrible. Why are you allowing this to happen? And he's missing the whole point of he's got Jesus in his home and is doing nothing with it. She's coming into his presence and taking what is most valuable to her and shattering it and breaking it, and pouring it out, and saying, Jesus, everything I have is yours. This would be the moment, let's, let's go off the idea for a moment that 
her sin wasn't anything sexual, that she was a young woman that was just in sin, that just like any of us, that we all have our mistakes, we've all messed up, and that maybe 10 years from now that she was going to get married, she had already used her alabaster jar. She had already used her dowry and said, this is the thing that's most valuable to me. I'm going to bring it to the feet of Jesus. I'm going to break it, and I'm going to pour it out at his feet because he is worthy of everything I have. But that's not what Simon's doing. Simon's not doing that at all. He's looking and saying, well, you're a teacher. He's so focused on the right here, the right now. The, you're not doing the right thing. You're not doing what a, a good rabbi should do. You, should, you shouldn't even let her in here right now. You should kick her out. And just like even with Mary and Martha later on, you see this all the time. It's like two people in the presence of Jesus, and one gets it, and one has no clue. And misses the boat over and over again. This woman, she identifies that this is Christ. That everything else in this world doesn't matter. The value that this world can give me, it doesn't matter. That, I mean, I could hold on to this jar. And let's say that hers was 300 denarii as well. $54,000, that would be the equivalent. 300 denarii in that time period would be the equivalent of a year's salary. Imagine right now giving up a year's salary to something that God called you to do. Or maybe it's giving up the job that's giving you that salary and taking a, a lesser paying job because God is calling you to do it. Giving up something that has incredible value to you, something that defines you, that makes you who you are because all of a sudden God says, I don't want that to be who you are anymore. I want you to take that life and I want you to throw it away. See, I don't think many of us in this room have a $50,000 jar of perfume or cologne at home. Hopefully, definitely not cologne. I mean, there's decent smelling colognes that are much cheaper than $50,000. But I think all of us have something in our life that could be represented. I've got a little jar here. It's, I don't know, it's not alabaster, but I want this jar this morning to kind of represent the thing that's most valuable in all of our lives. For this woman in the story, this jar was represented by that perfume because culturally, this is the greatest worth that she had. It helped define who she was. And she had one moment where she could use this jar. One moment, one place, one time where she could break this open and say, either this is going to prepare me for my death, or this is going to be a moment in my life where I'm going to pour myself out and say, all I am is yours. But for us in this room, that's not our culture anymore. That's not our tradition. We don't give jars like this out and say on, on your wedding night, break this, and it is a part of a tradition in the American culture. But I would have to ask, for all of us, I would say that there is something that is more valuable than anything else that this jar would represent. What is it that if God called you and said, I want you to do this, break the jar? What is it that you're going to just give up everything and just say, God, all I have is yours? I think of the doubts that we were just praying for them a few moments ago. They had a moment about a decade ago where they chose and said, we're going to Nicaragua. We're, we're going to follow after what God said. We're going to leave the American culture behind. We're going to raise our children away from their grandparents. We're going to live this unique, different lifestyle because, God, all we have is yours. I don't, I mean, when I think of so many missionaries that I've sat down and met with, the, the courage and the strength to, especially those with young children, to say that we're going to move to another nation, a poorer nation, a nation on the other side of the planet, or even just simply, we're going to move away because God told us to, and trust that God's going to take care of us, trust that other people are going to help us raise our money so that we can live in another country, in another nation, and in this case right now for the doubts, living in a nation where there is all kinds of uh, controversy and government uprisings that are happening, that they're willing to say, I'm going to give everything because that's what God has called us to do. It makes me even feel like in my own life that, God, what are you saying for, for me as an individual? I know for Annie and I, uh, as we're quickly approaching, uh, Annie mentioned this yesterday. A year ago, like this Sunday, like the first Sunday in June uh, last year, 
was the day that Jeff Aladdin came and spoke and walked through the process of what a pastoral change would be. Many of you probably didn't even know this. Annie was actually here that particular Sunday morning. She kind of went incognito just to kind of check out the church. And that began a process for us of saying, well, it's not super far. It's not moving to a different country. We're moving away from our comforts. We're moving away from people that we know, moving away from life as we knew it because God was calling us to something different. It was a moment of saying, okay, God, here's our jar. Do what you want in our life. Do something. And for all of us in this room, we have to ask that question of, God, what is it that my jar represents? Is it the fact of, I haven't trusted you with money, and I need to offer this jar up and say, God, have your way in my life? Maybe it's the fact of, you know that you have the, the time and ability to serve and help. I'll, I'll tell you, we will never turn away help in the nursery. We'll never turn help away help in kids' ministry and youth ministry. If you feel like you've got a calling on your life, a particular ministry, like me, it's raining today. If you have a calling in your life to be a parking lot ministry where you walk umbrellas to people and get them in when, on mornings or it rains, we're not going to turn that away. What is the calling that God has placed on your life that says, this is why I want to get up in the morning. This is what I want to do at church because I want to do everything I can to make my church be the best place it can be so it can be the best representation of Christ that it can be. Maybe for you, it's a matter that you know that your job has you traveling all over the place, and you say, it makes, it makes me all kinds of money. It really helps take care of my family. But you feel like God's saying, give up that job, take this job so you can be at home with your family. It could be all sorts of different things. It could be the fact that you have a perfectly fine habit, a fun habit that you're doing, but it just takes up too much of your time. And God's saying, I want you to back off of that. I want you to give it up so that you can spend more time in my words, spend more time uh, with me. Maybe it's the fact that you have been stuck in a sin for so long that you're struggling with that you cannot get out of and you say this is my alabaster jar this is this is what I value because whatever we value it's based off of what we say that this has more value than Christ that I'm holding this back away from Christ because I don't want him to have this area of my life that God you can have this you can have this but here's the thing God is either Lord of all or he's the Lord of nothing you can't tell God. You can be over every area of my life. You can have total control, but you can't have control of this area because this is mine. Think of that for a moment. You're telling the God of the universe, the God that created you, you can't have this. You gave me life. You gave me hope. You gave me peace. You gave me all these different things. But God, this, this is mine. This is my precious. It makes you kind of, if you're familiar with Lord of the Rings, like Gollum, of like, it's my precious. Like, this is mine. Everything else, God, is it's yours, but this is mine. That's not how God works. When we get close to God, it's saying, God, you get everything. I trust you. I give you my life. I give you control over all. And there comes a moment where we have to say, God, it's either my way or it's your way. So some of you are already uncomfortable, you're like, he's going to break something. <laughs> but for too many of us, we'll do this. We'll, we'll come to the presence of God and say, God, I'm willing to, to cry. The, let my tears fall on your feet. I'll, I'll wash your feet. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. But God, I'm holding on to this jar. This jar should be yours. You went to the cross for me. You died for me. You've forgiven your sins. But God, I'm holding on to this. And we sound so selfish. When in reality, God wants us to lay this down at his feet to lift the hammer up. But we're, we, we feel like, God, but that's going to cause me pain. Yeah, it probably will. God, that's going to that's be uncomfortable. Yeah, it probably will for a time. And so you're uncertain and you, you kind of fight it and you're like, God, I, I don't want to do this because I don't like the results. And you know those moments where you say like, you, you rip off the bandage because if you kind of peel it, it's going to be uncomfortable and it's going to be painful. And then all of a sudden you say, you know what? That wasn't so bad. I could see some of you as I kept going with the hammer. It was kind of that, is he going to actually do that? Like, I kind of want that for my house. He just broke a jar. 
get it for uh, $7.99 at home on Grasha. <laughs> quick, quick stop after church. But here's the thing. In this moment, when the jar is broken, and anyone in this room, when you have laid down what God has called you to actually do, you realize once that perfume comes out, once you start giving God what he is asking you to do, that didn't hurt so bad. That actually felt really good. And then all of a sudden you start realizing, you know what, God? Is there anything else in my life that's like that? Is there anything else that you want me to give up? Because the first time is always the most difficult. But when we're stuck in sin, especially what's amazing is so often people realize that we're stuck in sin. But we kind of keep hoping, well, if I don't say anything or I fake my way through things, they won't realize that's going on. All the while, the Holy Spirit is trying to say, just give it up. Just say it. Just get it out there. Because why would you want to hold back a lie? Why would you want to hold back, or hold back the truth, really, and say, I don't want to really give you the real story of what's going on in my life? That's not God. God wants you to flush it out into the light, because whenever you get caught in a lie or you get caught in sin, that initial moment, it stinks. It's not fun. But once it's out there, then you can start moving forward. You can start moving away from the pain because there's recognition of, yeah, that happened. But there's a freeing feeling when all of a sudden sin is exposed to the light because in the light, sin has no power. The same way when you say, this is what I care about, when you start realizing that when you can break it open and see, that doesn't have any value. This, this really doesn't bother me anymore. Because when you look at it, this is already broken. Like, if you were sitting there, like, hoping I wasn't going to break it, and I would raffle it off for missions after service or something, that you would say, you know what? This has no value anymore. So, God, if you, if you call me and you say, break it again, it kind of begins fun, you know? Like, if you've ever done a, a project in your house and you want to tear apart a kitchen and you're going to tear out the old cabinets, that first swing is always kind of uncertain because... Do I really want to do this? Like, this is going to be costly. This is going to be an investment of my time. This is going to be a process in my life. But as soon as you do it the first time, you kind of become like a five-year-old. Or like, I get this from the hammer. This is going to be good. That I've seen before where, like, people will do for fundraisers. They'll bring in an old car, a broken-up car, where people will pay money to swing a sledgehammer at. To me, like, I've, I've never done it yet, but to me, that would be something cool to say. It's always in the back of your head, like, what would it be like to swing a sledgehammer at somebody else's car? I remember going on a mission trip, it was uh, to Jamaica with the Puff Paths, and we were tearing something down, and somebody, like, this is like young college Scott that still had to work through uh, different anger issues and whatnot, but somebody had really upset me on the trip, and it was my turn to swing a sledgehammer at a brick wall. And I remember, like, everybody, they would take their turn, they would go for a couple minutes, and then they would get tired. And then it was my turn, and I was picturing his face right there on the wall. And all of a sudden, it's like 10 minutes later, I'm still swinging away. It's like, Scott, do you want, you want to trade out? No, I'm good. Because <laughs> there, there's almost this fun part when it's towards someone else or towards something else. But when we realize that we come to our own life, there is pain that happens at first, but once you realize that what gets poured out when we are doing what God is calling us to do is so much sweeter and so much better than anything we could do, then we trust God that says, you know what? If you've provided for me and you've taken care of me, I'm going to continue pouring myself out and trusting you in everything. The first initial moment of breaking your alabaster jar is the most difficult, but once you do it, you realize that Jesus here, he is simply saying, Simon, you're wrong because you're not doing anything. She's right. Call her a sinner. Call her whatever you want. But she's the one who has her priorities right in this moment. She's the one who cares about me. She's the one who sees what's really going on and is doing something about it. And for so many people, well, you could be here this morning, and for any of the reasons I've mentioned, that could be your alabaster jar. You may know people who are stuck, and they're, they're looking at the, the complete good jar when you realize that they're really they're a broken person and they're hiding their brokenness and that they need, they need to just lay everything down at Christ's feet and break that jar and allow him to be Lord of all and trust him that he has the best. 
So it could be you or it could be someone else, but this morning I just want to challenge you that when we look at this woman, that we don't know her name, she is only identified as a sinful woman. But it's a sinful woman that who had her act together and figured it out. I would, I mean, I would love to know what her actual name is. But I'm glad that it's, that's why even on your bulletin this morning, I didn't write the sinful woman. Because in my mind, she's not the sinful woman. She's the woman that figured it out and got things right. As we look at the last couple of weeks of this series, the first week we talked about Sarah and the faith that it required for her to walk through the process of having uh, her son at such an old age and knowing that there's a promise that she was going to be, her and Abraham were going to be the, the father and mother of a great nation and see so many, when in reality she only ever sees Isaac. She doesn't even get to see Isaac married. He's somewhere in the neighborhood, I forgot uh, offhand, but around 32 years old, and then Sarah dies. She doesn't see him get married. She doesn't see the lineage that happens afterwards. But she has faith to realize that God is a God who is faithful and will do what he says he's going to do. Last week we looked at Ruth, and we looked at somebody for every purpose, had the right to go out and just turn around when Naomi told her to turn around and go home. She was faithful. She was going to follow Naomi back to Judah, but said, you know what? I'm going to go back. She, she could do that, but that's not what God was calling her to do. God said, go with Naomi. Leave your people, leave the, the gods of your people, and go back with her. And because she was willing to obey, she was able to see something great happen. She was able to become a part of the lineage of Jesus himself. So we look at Sarah and we look at uh, Ruth, that both of them, because they're willing to be faithful and they're willing to obey, that they both enter into the lineage of Jesus in his, his, uh, his eventual birth. But I think the beautiful thing here with this, uh, this woman, because she's willing to break her alabaster jar, she doesn't get to be in the lineage of Jesus being born, but she gets to become part of the lineage of when Jesus dies and comes back to life and being resurrected and forgiven. She gets to become a part of this lineage on the backside of things. And she gets to see that God has great things in store, that God wants to do great things for her in her life. And if we're willing to do three things, be faithful, or we're willing to obey, and we're willing to lay everything down to humble ourselves at Jesus' feet, take care of him, and give up what is most valuable in our life. Great things can happen. If the worship team can, can come forward. This morning, is we're just in a time of uh, being at the altar and just, we're, we're going to be singing anchor again. I just would pray that for every single one of us in this room, that this jar would represent our attitude this morning and our heart this morning of saying, God, I need you to, to take what is this valuable thing in my life, what I'm holding on to, and help me break it. Help me just shatter it. Help me lay it at your feet and know that this is an actual value. But giving everything I am and laying it all down at your feet, that's true value. That is what you are calling me to do. That is how you want me to live my life. That's what you want me to do. Because it's worth so much more than an alabaster jar. It's about your heart condition. Your issue may not be that you have $50,000 in perfume and you don't know what to do with it. It could simply be the fact that God is calling you to something. God is calling you to give something. God is calling you to be faithful in an area that you haven't been faithful. God is calling you to, to pray for someone that in the back of your mind you say, you know what, I'm never going to pray for them. Imagine for a moment that the, the actor, the athlete, the politician, the neighbor, whoever it is that makes you the most angry, the most frustrated, is the source of your uh, struggles with this world. Imagine if you stopped complaining about them to other people. You stopped complaining about them on Facebook. You stopped complaining about them to God, and you started praying for them. It's really, really difficult to complain about somebody when you're praying for them. 
We can look at different things that happen in the news and be like, well, that's not fair. Whoever said that this world was going to be fair? We are passing through this world. We're in but not of this world. And we get upset when this world is playing by different rules. My, my life, my, my goal, my direction is making it to heaven and taking as many people with me as possible. I stand with one person, that's Christ. I don't stand with an athlete. I don't stand with an uh, actor. I don't stand with a politician. My goal is seeing Jesus made famous and doing whatever I can to take whatever in my life that I say is valuable and breaking it and saying, God, have your way in my life. In our weakness, we are made strong. But so often we have the attitude of saying, God, I want to be strong. No, it's God, make awareness of where my weaknesses are. Make awareness where my faults are, where my failures are. And Lord, use me in those areas. Use me to pray for the people that I don't want to pray for. Because just imagine if the people that you're so frustrated with, all of a sudden they became Christians. And they use the gifts that they're currently using for the glory of God. The political leaders where you're like, you know, I, I don't like that. I don't like what they're doing. But all of a sudden, God got a hold of their heart because Christians rose up and prayed for them instead of tearing them down. I want to be like this woman who put down her alabaster jar and broke it. I don't want to be like Simon who's pointing out every single politician, actor, athlete, whoever, co-worker, boss, and saying, God, it's not fair that they're doing this. It's not fair that they're doing that. Because then we become like Simon. And we become like the guy who didn't get it. Instead, we can say, you know what, God? All I have is yours. I'm going to pray for people. I'm going to fast for people. And I'm going to trust that you are in charge, that you are in control, and that greater things can happen. Even when I think of this jar here, what we can run into, and even in the church culture, is say, you know what? I remember when as a church we used to do this, or as a church we used to do that. But what if God is saying, let that go? Because look at the work I'm about to do. Something greater is coming. The reason why so many of the Pharisees missed it is because they were so focused on what they thought the church should be that they didn't see who Jesus really was. So many Israelites, they were looking for Jesus to be a political leader, and when he refused to be the political leader and was being the spiritual leader, it led to his eventual crucifixion. God doesn't work the way we expect him to. God doesn't work the way we want him to. God works the way that's right. And so for all of our lives, we need to have that attitude saying, God, whatever you say, whatever you want me to break, whatever you want me to do, have your way in my life. And when we start doing it, life becomes fun. Because we don't have to do it on our own. We're doing what God has called us to do. Going back to the beginning of service, a belly flop competition. There's some things that may make you feel ridiculous. That was a big crowd that I got up in front of and flopped into the water but I gave it all I had. There may have been someone who came along and did it better, did a bigger splash. It doesn't matter. I don't have to compare what I'm doing to what they're doing. I just have to do what God's called me to do. Don't worry if somebody, more people know them, they have more influence. Use the influence that God has given you right here, right now, to do what he's called you to do and sacrifice and give what he's called you to sacrifice and give. This morning as we sing, the altars are open. If you need to, to come and you, you need to come to a place where you can assemble, essentially give up your alabaster jar and break it, you can sit in your seat and pray. You can stand on your feet and worship. Whatever you need to do. But let's just take a couple moments and realize that God, these alabaster jars, what, what is valuable in my life has to be broken because your way has to be greater than my way. You are more powerful. You are greater. Have your way in my life. Would you just join us as we worship for just a few moments?